Good morning, everyone. Good morning, and, and thank you for being here with us today at, uh, at uh, Flinders at Tonsley. It's an absolute pleasure to have you all with us. Uh, my name's Catherine Anderson. I'm the Deputy Director at the New Venture Institute here at Flinders. Uh, I would like to first uh, make acknowledgement that we meet today on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people and that we respect uh, and acknowledge their, their connection to land, both past and present. Um, one of my favourite things to, to mention is that my understanding is that the traditional uh, Kaurna name for this area is Windy Place by a River. And there are days when that is really, really apparent <laughs> here. A beautiful day today, so if this is your first time here at Tonsley, then please do take a, a few moments to have a look around. It's a, an absolutely gorgeous place to work, an absolute privilege for us to work here. Of course, Australia's first and premier innovation district, where we bring the triple helix together of government, industry and education and research. Uh, for us, it's wonderful to be part of, of this environment and of this, uh, uh, this site. And wonderful, of, of course, to partner with uh, Green Industries South Australia to bring Trevor Schultz to you today. I won't say too much, I'm going to pass over to Vaughan. Uh, he's going to introduce Trevor to you in a much more deep way than I could. Uh, a couple of points of housekeeping. Should you hear a beep beep, the first, uh, you know, should we need to evacuate very quickly, a beep beep will alert you to, uh, to be alert, not alarmed. Um, grab everything that you need to take with you, should we need to egress fast. Um, should, you, should that then go to a whoop whoop, we will proceed uh, to, uh, <laughs> to, to raving, no we won't rave, we'll proceed to, to exit the building um, and move to the, the north uh, west uh, car park. If you do need uh, the, the toilets, they are behind the lifts, uh, so straight out here and behind the lifts. Uh, other than that, if you haven't helped yourself to some tea or coffee, then, then please do so. This is a nice intimate setting, so that's lovely for us to be able to have a, a nice conversational uh, kind of session this morning, uh, so please feel welcome for that. We'll have about an hour listening to Trevor uh, speak to us about collect collective, uh, co collective, cooperative collectives, um, co cooperative platforms, sorry. Um, then we'll have Q&A. When we do q and I am going to ask that you use the mic because we are recording, so uh, fix your hair now if you need to. Uh, other than that, I will pass over to Vaughan. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and welcome everybody. Um, Trevor's here only for like today and he's leaving tomorrow so we're kind of um, very happy to spend this time with him. Um, my name's Vaughan Levitsky, I'm Chief Executive of Green Industries SA. Um, this is a, a, a really unique offering um, for us today. Uh, we're interested in supporting economic models um, that help foster the green economy. Um, including cooperative business models uh, which can provide economic security and retain value. Um, there's also the phenomenon of work being organised through digital technology and that can be designed to achieve positive economic and social outcomes. A platform cooperative is an online platform to facilitate the sale of goods and services that is organised as a cooperative owned and democratically governed by its employees, customers, users and other <coughs> stakeholders. We've partnered, Green Industries that is, we've partnered with the Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals, the New Venture Institute at Flinders, the Department of State Development, the Don Dunstan Foundation and the Adelaide Festival of Ideas to bring platform cooperative researcher Trevor Schultz of the New School of New York City to Adelaide as part of a national tour. He's off to Sydney and then Melbourne after this. So in a world where traditional employment opportunities are disappearing, the platform cooperative approach, which is emerging internationally as the intersection of digital technology and traditional cooperatives, offers a really interesting new and possibly more secure way of making a meaningful life, livelihood. Trevor's going to show us how this phenomenon is already creating purposeful, sustainable opportunities for work and building local economic prosperity. So please welcome Associate Professor Trevor Schultz. Thank you. 
Well, first of all, um, thank you, everybody, for the warm welcome. And uh, thank you for all the people who made such a wonderful effort to bring me here. So I'm very grateful to be here and um, enjoyed my time in Adelaide so far. OK, so I will uh, start by well, contextualizing what I will say uh, with a quote from one of my Australian colleagues, from one of my many Australian colleagues, uh, Mackenzie Walk, who wrote that the kind of mode of production we appear to be entering is one that I don't think is quite capitalism as classically described. This isn't capitalism. This is something worse. Uh, and so what, uh, this, he is not alone with this kind of analysis. And so what may he mean by that? And what do other people like uh, Wolfgang Strieck, for example, who uh, uh, wrote uh, also about the future of capitalism and others have similar bleak uh, analysis? So uh, you know, after a period uh, of the world wars in which inequality uh, was kept at bay. Uh, you had, uh, especially since 1978, a sharp increase in uh, inequality uh, to uh, this date. And uh, at the same time, a real increase in public and private debt. Right? So what this means is also that at the same time, uh, productivity of the American worker increased while uh, wages, uh, if adjusted for inflation, uh, were pretty much uh, the same, right? So in the last few years, I think also part of this uh, picture <laughs> is that in the 20th century, uh, in many countries, uh, political democracy really propagated, but work workplace democracy, not so much, right? So there, I think there's a real conflict there. And I think also a backdrop for what I want to talk about is that I would say over the last few years, maybe you know, put the year 2014, you could say that the World Wide Web hit rock bottom, right? So that that in a way, uh, that there's a real crisis also which was happening on the internet. This is not the internet that the founders had imagined, right? Which was all about philanthropy in many ways, like and about you know, altruistic uh, uh, commitments and uh, definitely not about a concentration of uh, you know, monopolies and data concentration as we see it today. So this is uh, the backdrop also over the last 40 years, this period that I uh, inscribed. There is a shift away from direct employment. So we have in the United States now, uh, every third person is a freelancer or independent contractor, 55 million people out of a workforce out of, uh, of 150 million. So this is a significant uh, force and development. And this does not mean that, that uh, I propose some kind of uh, romance for employment. Right? Not to say that this is now a, a terrible move uh, in, on all fronts, but what it does mean is uh, that all the rights that were traditionally attached to employment, and this is, I would very much insist on that, have been stalled and are lost right, in this new model. And so while there are many negative things we can say about employment, uh, for example, as is uh, often pointed out, right, employment was just a stint in history, right? so just a very short period in history. You know, much of the same situation you had before with a lot of uh, uh, you know, casual, uh, uh, informal work. And uh, so in a way, this is just a return. But I think what is really lost are uh, these rights. I think also what we can see this in context of is uh, uh, a real shift towards um, isolationist, uh, xenophobic uh, tendencies that if you now put this all together, put uh, you know, a particular part of the workforce really at risk. And uh, this, is, I think, is what I want to address. So these are some of the rights that are essentially uh, put to rest. Right? So there are no more unemployment benefits, the eight-hour workday right, that the unions fought so hard for, the uh, paid leave, uh, paid sick leave, and uh, other rights are all gone. And workers' comp, I don't know if you use the same language here, basically getting injured on the job. If that happens to you in this gig economy, there is no uh, protection at all. So this is uh, just sort of to set uh, this up. So what I want to talk about, I don't know, in the next 40 minutes or so is, uh, so first of all, I want to 
uh, characterize this uh, climate change of digital labor, if you want to call it that. Then I want to talk about a near-term alternative, so this platform co-op model that uh, people already alluded to. I will give you plenty of examples in all kinds of various types. I will look at which sectors uh, are most affected by that, and then project uh, forward. All right. So. Uh, Let's uh, start with this. So in the on-demand economy, the gig economy, the collaborative economy, the sharing economy, whatever you want to call it, uh, of course, uh, just from your own experience, right, many of you will embrace this uh, with open arms simply because it is convenient. Uh, there are many advantages uh, you know, to using an app to call a taxi than being on the phone. It's uh, much more you know, efficient and it's, uh, th there is clearly some advantage there, right? Uh, but on, uh, and, and at the same time, it's also offering access to gigs for people in between jobs, like students, for example. Uh, and uh, this, these are not terrible paid jobs either, at least not in the United States. I don't know, with Airtasker here, it seems to be a bit different. But with TaskRabbit, this, the, the similar service in the United States, it's actually relatively well paid. It also uh, delivers opportunities for the upper middle class. So if you have a four bedroom apartment on the Upper West Side on the, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and you can go to the Hamptons for the weekend, uh, you can make a few extra thousand dollars by renting out your beautiful apartment to Airbnb guests. Uh, so these advantages are really playing out for people who have extra assets, right? So this is not exactly something that the poor can do uh, very much, right? So I think in this kind of uh, comment you don't hear very often from uh, the likes of Airbnb. So this whole gig economy is, is very hard to sort of get your hand on in terms of data. We just talked about this on the, on the way here. Um, and so the data really differ depending on like if you look at government data or if you look at McKinsey data, McKinsey's data or Pew Institute's data. But uh, so the Pew, a Pew survey basically suggests that 24% of Americans reported earning uh, from a platform in 2016, which is pretty significant, right? So I think over the uh, longer term, right, this will definitely be something to be reckoned with, even if it's not a significant force right now, particularly uh, as a template for work, right? Not so much that now suddenly everybody will work through apps, but that the kinds of work relations that are established there uh, are applied all throughout the economy, right? So you see that very clearly, and I can talk about this with examples from the pharmaceutical company Merck, uh, for example, and others that really adapted this kind of uberization of society, if you want to call it that. So I mapped this out in this first book here. This is uh, so the first book, Uberworked and Underpaid, uh, uh, draws uh, a landscape of digital labor and sort of introduces you to these uh, forms of digital labor that have been introduced since 2005, roughly. Uh, and then in Hours to Hack and to Own, which is an edited collection, uh, Basically, you will find many voices that uh, comment particularly on platform cooperativism. Okay, so there has been over the last uh, years, but also more intensified over the last few months, a lot of uh, pushback against this, you know, sharing economy, collaborative economy, whatever. What's the term you're using here in Australia? Sharing economy, collaborative, sharing? sharing. Okay. So there has been, I don't know if you heard about uh, uh, the CEO of um, uh, Uber, uh, 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 nah, Travis, Travis Kalanick, uh, joined the uh, economic advisory team of uh, the Trump administration uh, for a brief moment, uh, in response to which uh, 200,000 people deleted their Uber account, <laughs> uh, which which uh, alarmed him, which is interesting, right? Because he would think like somebody who runs a global empire like that wouldn't be alarmed by 200,000 people deleting his app. Uh, but he withdrew from the advisory board uh, in response to that, which really made you think like, wow, this, is, this whole thing might be much more shaky than you actually wanted to believe, right? And uh, there are, of course, many other uh, examples in this uh, context. So Susan Fowler was a former engineer at Uber, and she wrote this like really damning uh, 
some of you read it, right, a blog post about the very misogynistic culture at uh, Uber uh, for her as a woman engineer uh, who reported sexual harassment frequently and was told by HR that uh, this guy who is harassing her is a really high performer so they will not touch him and many stories like that. So uh, when she joined, 15% of uh, uh, engineers at Uber were women. When she left, it was 6%. So uh, a real, uh, so then you can uh, you know, find out more about the uh, stories around race, racial discrimination on Airbnb, which they have also been many. So I'm just hinting at these things. I don't, we don't really have time to go into this. There were over 100,000 uh, Ola and Uber uh, drivers striking in India. And uh, so it's really, it's, it's in many ways a market failure, right? So you see that the model in many ways doesn't work. You can add to that that uh, each ride that you're taking with an Uber car is subsidized by the company. So it's, you are not actually paying what it really costs to operate this. So this is just in the interim until competition is eradicated, at which point they then can charge what it actually costs. Uh, so to sum this up, basically, you could say <clears throat> that you all heard about these uh, privacy uh, intrusions of Uber, right? So uh, they record one night stands in Manhattan. This was one example. Uh, they would uh, uh, record your work routines. And so any kind of uh, um, analysis of your, p of your big data, if you like, or your little data, your small data, uh, are then used to basically kick in search pricing when they know that you depend on their service, right? And uh, so, the, and in addition, you can point to the data centralization, right? So, which is a real uh, aspect to think about that now with the big five, right, if you like, so these just basically all our data just being in the hand of these like five big companies, uh, it's an enormous data centralization, which is not only uh, a threat uh, because now hackers can actually access this, which we've seen actually does happen, right? But it's also a question, of course, that's un it's an enormous centralization of power that, that you see. Uh, it's an attack on public infrastructure. So in New York City, you already see uh, the subway system and uh, buses being used less. And in fact, uh, this little drawing here alludes to a Lyft ad in the New York City subway, where they basically show, yeah, we cover, this is supposed to be all the avail available cars, we cover all of the, new, uh, the subway system, but we also go beyond it. So, uh, and we also go in between. So basically say, we can replace this, right? So that is clearly the message. Uh, and uh, then also never before really, and this is, uh, I, th I say this, uh, carefully, really never before there's really something new about the kind of exploitation that is uh, taking place. I call it crowd fleecing, mm. which uh, is basically that uh, millions of people are accessed at the same time through one company online and in real time are working for that company. Right? So another fact, like when you got up this morning uh, and uh, had a coffee most likely or a tea and I don't know, maybe you switched on your laptop or your cell phone, that the chances are that even the people in this room, if we would compare this, all of you probably accessed sites that are really only owned by four or five companies, right? And uh, so the sites that we depend on most, right, are owned by a number of people that is so small that they could probably all fit into one Google bus, right? So, uh, and so there you see a problem. And then, of course, there's this, obfuscation of language that you have in the sharing economy, right? So they're really talking like this when they are in fact that, right? So, uh, it's, uh, so it's this language of uh, counterculture that is mobilized, uh, the, the language of love and you know, disruption. And, and we just talked about this from a conference, we've, we've, from a festival we've been to uh, a while ago in Paris where the keynote speaker was uh, wearing these prayer beads and he would you know, uh, squat on the, on the stage and would meditate to start off the conference uh, to then uh, solicit a group hug by everybody in the audience, uh, then show slides of the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street before he would introduce his business model. And this is just classic, that is, this is what I, I'm suggesting here. So the language is basically trying 
to talk about sharing and peer-to-peer -peer and uh, you know, even the language, like Eva Elus, the uh, Israeli sociologist, talked about it basically being the language of intimacy. It's almost like lovers being on their pillow at night, talking to each other. This is kind of like what is evoked, right? This kind of intimacy, when in fact, it, they are selling a service, right? So uh, it's an obfuscation of language, also one that tries to hide that what they, what they are actually doing is that they are operating as labor companies and what they are trying to sell is that they are tech companies. When in fact Uber is not a startup or a tech company but is actually a transportation slash labor company which a European court just ruled last week for the first time actually making this very clear once and for all. Um, it's also the question of the language around innovation. Is this really innovation? If, if you basically are able to create short-term profits for shareholders and shovel this to Silicon Valley, or should we think about innovation just like the people in this photo, which is the uh, Barcelona uh, City Council, uh, should we think just like them that innovation would actually mean something where the value and the wealth that is created stays in the community? Right? I mean, what's the logic of some, somebody like Airbnb coming in, installing an app in Australia, and then you renting out your room, and the profits from that go to California? Why can't this stay in Australia? Would it be so hard to have the five biggest cities in Australia create something like Airbnb and have the value of that is generated stay in your country? So. And then, of course, the, the elephant in the room is also uh, artificial intelligence and uh, <laughs> this question, basically, that is moving very fast where, you know, you will very soon possibly see city infrastructure being dedicated to particular companies. So you may have very well have an Apple city, an Uber city, a Google city, uh, if nobody intervenes, right? So the central question then becomes really uh, how can cooperatives or mutuals or you know, government for that matter insert themselves in this discussion around AI ownership, right? The ownership of the artificial intelligence uh, algorithms and uh, to basically not leave the field just to these like three or four companies. Uh, okay, so then uh, second, uh, I think one of the Issues is, I don't know, you, you have uh, all heard about universal basic income. Is that something that mm -hmm. kicks around in Adelaide? Uh, <laughs> not so much. Some shake their head. Uh, so, you know, so experiments in, in the United States, you have the Alaska Fund. And in Finland, uh, there are experiments to actually roll this out. In Switzerland, they voted on it, right, already. So this is definitely something that is around. Anybody know what we're talking about? Uh, no. The idea that essentially well, it's a Republican entity, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, um, it's not tied to any particular uh, party uh, and has very different interpretations which could lead to all kinds of very diverse outcomes. But the idea is essentially to just cut everybody a check, every citizen, and then cut all social benefits, right? So, uh, so you get a check of 800 or 1,000 euros. I think in Switzerland they discussed 1,500 Swiss francs, no, 2,500 Swiss francs per month, uh, but then no benefits. So that's great, right? So I'm a total fan of that. Uh, however, uh, at least living in the United States, I can tell you that ain't going to happen very soon, and certainly not for the next four years. Uh, and uh, so what, what is, uh, is going to happen in the meantime, right? So I think with Occupy Wall Street and many other activist projects, there was, is a bit of the problem that uh, people understand the problems, but there is really nothing they can do until next Thursday, right? Mm -hmm. So there it's, you know, UBI is fantastic, right? Universal basic income is great, but that's just like way out there, right? Uh, and uh, there are other things like a post-work society, right? attached to that, like a post-capitalist society perhaps, if you're an anarchist or a communist or wherever you come from. Uh, so, but this is all, and you will probably agree, quite far away, right? So what can you do in the near future? So, and I think this is where what I want to suggest uh, uh, plays a particular role because it really is a project that you can do, uh, attack, uh, tackle right now. So it's about creating more diversity, right? So I had just mentioned the, 
the colonization of the internet. I had mentioned the data centralization. And the idea is basically to, to create a diverse uh, digital economy, but not uh, just like this keynote speaker that I mentioned who tries to basically say to change everything, click here, right? So this is not about uh, tackling uh, all social problems through an app, right? But this is uh, about a social technic a socio technical solution, right? So it's really, it's as much social as it is about technology. And I will explain that. So it's not about techno solutionism, right? And it's also not just about our one model, but it's really about, uh, a, uh, as I always say, uh, the next uh, big thing is uh, lots of small things, right? So, uh, and so it's on the one hand, right, not about the sort of unicorn uh, monoculturalism that has uh, a failure rate of 94% in the city where I come from. So 94% of all startups fail. And in part they fail because what happens is that, uh, you know, the, the, these young entrepreneurs, or these startup, startup uh, teams often see their only pathway in finding venture capitalist funding. And once they have that, they are basically beholden to that venture capitalist who makes many decisions that they may not like at all, right? And it puts them in the position to, in 18 or 24 months, which is pretty much how it works, there's a bit of a difference between California and New York. So New York is much more uh, finance driven. They want to see the money back soon. Uh, and so in 80 to 24 months, they need to pay this back or like start having profit. So if you think like that, then you basically think of your business as a vacuum cleaner, right? Because how else would you think about it? You have to suck value out of the economy. You have to suck value out of these communities, right? Because how else will you make it that fast? If you are, your business is a cooperative, it's a completely different approach. Right? Because your whole thinking is completely different. It's not about short-term profit, but it's about long-term effects on your community and on your workers. And I can substantiate that more. So now there's this uh, a term kicked around, which I like by uh, Jennifer Brandle and, and her colleagues, uh, of the zebra economy, which basically encompasses all these different solutions that I had uh, shown <coughs> before. So, you know, zebras are real, unicorns are not, right? So um, there's also a real opportunity here, which has uh, to do, you know, which uh, uh, the financial industry, of course, also realizes, which is there's a big opportunity in the retirement of baby boomers. Who, so a lot of businesses, literally trillions of dollars are changing hands already now and over the next few years when baby boomers retire. And so the idea is how can, uh, you basically uh, propagate the cooperative model in this moment so that also the cooperative model and worker ownership are on the table when, because not all of these businesses will be easily sold to Goldman Sachs and Barclays Bank, but some of them could also maybe be turned into worker-owned cooperatives. Uh, so you've seen these guys before, maybe? Yeah, some of you? Cooperatives, ever heard of it? Yes, Rochdale, somebody? Yeah, I'll get it. Good, good, good. So 1844, Equity Pioneer Society, uh, one of the first or the better documented uh, uh, consumer cooperatives. And, uh, and uh, Melina Morrison pointed me uh, to the fact that uh, basically just like <coughs> this image here, that the cooperative sector in a way is sort of hidden in plain sight, right? Mm -hmm. So she calls it the ninja economy. Uh, I just want to sort of allude to this fact, like just like this frog here, co-ops are kind of hidden in plain sight, right? In a way, in the United States, you have uh, REI, which is a huge uh, camping company a chain. Uh, you have uh, East Hardware, the second largest hardware store chain in the United States. Being cooperatives, nobody knows that, right? I mean, I, I they know, but Ace Hardware, hardly anybody knows that they are cooperative. So they are hidden in plain sight. Melina gave me these numbers. Uh, so in Australia, uh, 2,000 cooperative businesses, 15 million members, eight out of 10 Australians are members of at least one co-op or mutual organization. Of course, what that actually means in Australia and in the United States is uh, we can 
ask, right? I mean, that, that do they feel like they are <laughs> part of a meaningful cooperative? Are their values projected outwards? Maybe not always, right? So that's clear, but nevertheless. So here is uh, what I suggested in 2014. I wrote a, a text that basically sort of introduced this uh, uh, concept of platform cooperativism, suggesting to bring the, I had worked for the last 10 years on digital work, on digital labor, and uh, sort of out of that work came this, this, this uh, proposal to basically bring the uh, uh, cooperative uh, business model together with the digital economy, and so to create uh, cooperative ownership, and then also ownership of platforms and data, and also think about the fact that, you know, like I had alluded to you bef uh, alluded before, that uh, we should also think about like actually giving the people uh, a voice on the platforms that they rely on most, right? So this is part of this picture as well. Okay, so I think maybe I want to say my argument is that uh, platform co-ops can be as effective uh, in economic system than concentrated extractive ownership models. And uh, so here are some advantages. So if you say, well, you know, we know the unicorn model very well, but so like what are the actual advantages of this platform co-op model? So just to repeat, right, what I suggest is an Uber owned by the drivers uh, and something like Amazon owned by its users, uh, a stock photography site owned by the photographers that sell their work, um, a you know, cleaning app owned by the workers who provide the work forward. So the advantages are, I mean, you know this from the research on cooperatives, right? So cooperatives have a lower failure rate than other businesses. Uh, there is uh, worker ownership. There's a possibility for, you know, a, a for real worker voice, so that people actually have a voice about the, um, the uh, business where they are working. Uh, there is the uh, possibility to you know, really leave the, the, the uh, wealth in the community and not extract it and uh, port it to Silicon Valley for that matter. And there is a potential that is not realized yet, but there is a potential for data democracy. So a federated cooperative data commons, right? So that cooperatives very different to Uber or Airbnb or Airtasker, who would, that, who would never do that, right? It's just completely against their model, is that you actually work together and share your data for mutual benefit. Again, this, I mean, so I will give you one example where this is already realized, but uh, this is uh, more of a project. So the question is, like, if you ask uh, where these businesses actually come from, there are several answers to that. So this is sort of the transitions slide. They are coming out of traditional co-ops that have uh, adapted uh, this model and uh, built platform co-ops. They have also emerged out of a co-op union model. So I, I will show you examples where, they, where unions have uh, successfully uh, worked with co-ops to, uh, in, in basically to support this platform co-op. Uh, there are traditional startups where freelancers get together and start uh, an upstart. There are failed startups. Uh, in, in Belgium, for example, there is a food delivery app that simply went bankrupt and the couriers then took over and continued it as a cooperative. Uh, and then there is the speculation, there is more and more uh, voices call for antitrust legislation against Google and also possibly Uber. So, and then basically the moment these companies get broken up, one can call for one of these split companies to become a cooperative. Uh, so, Okay, so it's basically an opportunity for cooperatives to reinvent themselves, is a uh, opportunity for the worker ownership community, the worker ownership movement, which is of course its own, has its own history, right, in labor um, studies and uh, 
and for free software engineers to uh, reinvent themselves and of course also for unions to rethink their model. So we see the, all of this happening uh, within this model. One question that emerges in the context of the comments, but I that Michel Bowens, uh, my good <coughs> friend, was here uh, speaking. And uh, so he and I, we always haggle about this question because I uh, basically say that, you know, well, isn't there really a problem there, right, in the comments movement, which is that, you know, this is all fantastic. I, I support it 100%. But hey, you know, you need to admit that there is a real shortcoming, which is that people can't make a living of the comments. It might support their living partially, it makes it easier, but it doesn't really provide for a living, right? And uh, so the question basically that perhaps platform co-ops can address is how to make an ethical living uh, while still contributing to the comments. And I can address that in a, in a bit. So now I wanna give you a few uh, examples, okay? Um, so which sectors uh, are we talking about? Right? So this is also uh, on the right over here, people say like, well, which, in which areas does this play out, right? Uh, so just uh, in February, I created this uh, chart, and this is at that time uh, the various areas in which uh, platform co-ops were, were started and exist right now. So, you s and what you can see that it really ranges, is, is all over the economy, right? So it is not just one area at all. Uh, my uh, hunch is that and this is not just my hunch, but it's also based on research, uh, that basically uh, home healthcare is one of the most uh, promising areas in which this will play out. So there's already in Southern California a group of nurses, around 40 nurses, that uh, provide services for Latina women who are pregnant because what happens frequently is that they go for a first checkup once they are pregnant, but then because they have children already and they have problems with childcare, they can't pay for it, that they don't, do not go for follow-up visits because a problem. And so these nurses dedicate themselves to basically visit these women at home and found it a cooperative because otherwise they go through temp agencies and temp agencies take 50% of their wages 50% of their wages, right? So you can clearly see that a cooperative model in this uh, sector uh, gives a significant advantage. So they created an app, it's called Nurses Can, uh, in which they offer these services, just real breakdown of these services, and women can order them to come to their home for these uh, uh, prenatal services. So there is a map on our website, platform.coop, uh, which is uh, created by the Internet of Ownership. And uh, so there you can actually click into uh, a world map and see uh, the, you know, in each country which exact uh, uh, platform corps exist and uh, what they are dedicated to. I just created this sort of map. So you see, they are really, they vary comp uh, uh, enormously. So you have um, here, for example, uh, media companies, right, journalism. So I will give you examples from Greece, from the United States, and, and from the UK, where basically journalists created uh, uh, platforms to do their journalism, which are, and run this as a cooperative. Uh, there's even an online uh, TV station in the making that is cooperatively owned as well. Uh, SMART is a very interesting model, which is, uh, uh, comes out of Belgium and is, runs in eight European uh, countries, uh, which is basically uh, invites freelancers, mainly uh, creatives, to join this mutual risk uh, cooperative and uh, pay 6% of their uh, income to the cooperative, and in return, uh, they basically help them with uh, filing their taxes. And most importantly, whenever anyone uh, engages in a gig, in this gig economy, they pay them one week after what they will be paid from this company. So in other words, uh, the insecurity that comes with freelancing is uh, addressed by SMART. 
right? So, and then Smart retrieves the money from the employer. And uh, as there are tens of thousands of uh, freelancers part of Smart, nobody would dare to not pay them because then they will be blacklisted and would never work again. So, uh, and well, we can talk for hours about all these various examples. I'm just going to give you a few. There are brochures from Stocksy United, which is a Canadian uh, platform co-op uh, that brings together 1,000 uh, photographers that sell their work. And uh, the platform takes 3%, uh, I think, of the uh, profits to operate, and the rest goes to the photographers. And there, there is much to be said. We couldn't ask in the question. Very interesting how they engage in governance uh, on a platform like that, right? How photographers actually really have a say. All of this uh, we can address later. Uh, so here is the team. Um, and uh, interesting also that they come from iStock. So they actually came from a corporate background, which really gave them a very keen eye for the value proposition uh, that was, uh, is, a, is a key issue, right? So to really have an eye on the value proposition and not just get excited about founding a cooperative, which many people do, and then forgetting that they actually also have to offer something that people actually may want to have. So uh, then uh, this just uh, Up and Go just launched uh, last week in New York. So Up and Go offers uh, cooperative uh, home cleaning services. And uh, so here you basically, and there are really interesting things about it. Uh, that, for example, you can see, so uh, they charge 5% uh, for, to run the platform uh, versus the 25 to even 50% that corporate equivalents charge, right? So, and uh, one of the way, uh, so you see another advantage of platform co-ops is essentially that they are distributive then rather than speculative, right? So if you think of Uber as speculative and or, or Airtasker, which takes, uh, or TaskRabbit takes 30% from the workers, so they take five. Uh, and uh, so this is how it works. So you basically enter your uh, zip code. I entered it here, my postal code. And uh, then you get uh, the choice. This, this is a cooperative that uh, is working in my neighborhood, but on the website it looks like this. So uh, it basically just shows you a photo of the co-op, of all of them, of the workers, and you will never have an individual profile. So, and there is also no reputation rating at all. So, and this is, so you see that this, this cooperative way of working actually really also leads to different design choices, right? And uh, that these values are really embedded uh, in the site. So you can pick from various choices. This is a different, uh, uh, co-op, this is in Denver, uh, where Green Taxi is uh, cooperating with, is working together with the communications union to uh, basically, and the, and the role of the union here is basically to work with local policymakers to, to basically uh, support uh, the work of the co-op and have uh, legislation uh, basically tilt in favor of this business model. Right? The same thing that Uber is doing with all their millions of dollars, right, is uh, this help can be provided to these co-ops through unions. And uh, they have managed over the last two years, here are some of the drivers, they come from 70, 80, uh, 78 nations, uh, they're immigrants from 78 different nations. And if you've ever been to Denver, this is not what people in Denver usually look like. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, uh, and they have captured 37% uh, of the market in Denver right, over the last two years. Uh, Loconomics in San Francisco is uh, basically offering a labor brokerage for uh, massage therapists and uh, uh, tutors and uh, home cleaners and uh, many other freelancers that can all be organized to the site and which then also co-own co the site uh, collectively, right? So many examples. Maybe one of the ones that I'm uh, most excited about just because it really touches on this question of uh, data ownership, which I think is one of the most important issues of our time, uh, is uh, MyData. It's a Swiss site, so they pronounce it MyData. Um, and so the idea is basically to uh, create co uh, cooperative ownership of your health data. So 
if you are, uh, they, they come out of academia, the people who founded this, and they basically talked a lot about precision medicine, right? Uh, so how uh, if you have the DNA of a particular patient and then all the different information that is already available in one place, this could be a really awesome thing. Only if you think about it now outside of the realm of a cooperative, it sounds like a nightmare, right? Uh, because it sounds like the ultimate possibility for exploitation and for all the terrible things that can happen. But if you think about it in the context of a co-op and really where there is control over the centralization of health data, then from the perspective of biologists, one of them is a professor for biology at uh, ETH at, uh, in, in Zurich, uh, they say basically this allows for precision medicine actually for better treatment, right? And as the laws are very different from country to country, they basically imagine not this model that I had alluded before, which is currently the case, right? So you give your health data away, they are all locked up in a corporate cloud. And what they are suggesting is basically a federated cooperative model where all of these are in different countries, right? So you have national cooperatives handling them. But then one could say, for example, you could say if you have a rare disease, you could uh, uh, share those data, you know, to your own accord with other people in other countries that uh, would, would be much easier. You had actually access to your own data, which in the United States at least is very hard to even get access to your own data about you, right? So if you ask about that, that's not that easy to get. So, uh, so that's, I think, is a very interesting model. There is also something that is more at the concept stage, which is called Fair BNB, which is, uh, addressing, uh, this came out of a, a grassroots movement in Amsterdam, and now it's also uh, making its way through Canada and, uh, and Spain, uh, Barcelona, which are really faced with enormous tourism, right? So way too many tourists in, in Barcelona and Amsterdam, really uh, kind of destroying the city to an extent where locals you know, who have a grocery suddenly find a Nutella store, right? Which is really not what they need. But because suddenly there are all these tourists, uh, so basically businesses disappear. And so what the idea behind it was initially to basically block the number of tourists, to be able to block the number of tourists that can be in your city at any one time. Uh, and so basically why couldn't local government uh, support a citizen initiative like this? and then share this platform, let's say, among the five biggest uh, Australian cities. Uh, and then it would just be mandated uh, to use this short-term rental platform and not Airbnb, for example, right? So uh, this is, just to be clear, uh, not functioning yet. This is really more like a concept uh, think paper, like a manifesto, but they are working on it, right? So, and then is a campaign that many of you might be familiar with, or maybe not, who has heard of the buy Twitter campaign, yeah, I think three, four people, good. So they, uh, uh, I remember this, this is my a good friend and uh, colleague, right, uh, Nathan Schneider, who uh, wrote an op-ed for The Guardian and said like, hey, you know, uh, the Twitter is for sale, it's only $12 billion, <laughs> so why don't we buy it and turn it into a platform co-op? And uh, because, you know, Wall Street thought it was a failure, it only made 500 million, I think, uh, per, per quarter, so which clearly, was failure, and uh, so they, uh, you know, and now you have all this terrible stuff happening on Twitter where you have ads and videos that you really don't want to see, right, they're screwing it up, and uh, so wouldn't this be much more uh, a great idea to actually co-own a service that we all rely on and many of us really enjoy, right, and, uh, and I really thought like, okay, so everybody will think we are crazy, uh, I don't want to really be associated with that. And then uh, Nathan uh, had enormous success with that, uh, which was really, uh, I mean, success in the extent that there was a lot of media coverage of it. So Germany, for some reason, Germans were really into it, was all over the German press. Uh, and uh, so far that, of course, I have no idea what day it is today, but on May 22nd, yeah. uh, that's today. Uh, so today, Twitter shareholders actually vote if they want this. So Twitter, the Twitter, owner, the Twitter uh, founders uh, harshly spoke out against it, so they were really opposed. Uh, there was one uh, initial investor that spoke out in favor, uh, but now there has been a large uh, coalition of uh, co-op uh, leaders, 
uh, including the director of the ICA, the uh, International uh, Association of Cooperatives, uh, that uh, signed on to, to this project. Uh, so I think, if nothing else, I think it was a huge success in terms of uh, making people think about the possibility of cooperative ownership of internet platforms. Um, so here you can see the letter. You could still sign it. So this is like so other examples. I, I mentioned uh, cooperative news, right? So uh, positive news is an example of that. Uh, you have uh, in the U.S. the Banyan Project, which really thinks about, you know, in an age that really tries to think about like how maybe the co-op model can be an answer to this question of fake news, right? So at least in their own reporting, right? And uh, address uh, maybe some of the shortcomings that uh, are, uh, we see uh, with the media right now. Then in uh, Greece, uh, this uh, Syntacton uh, uh, news site was uh, bankrupt and the journalists basically decided to take it over and run it as a cooperative uh, and there are many examples uh, like it. So in Berlin you have uh, something you know in the US we talk about sanctuary cities uh, I would call it a sanctuary platform right in the sense that uh, it's basically it's called refugees work and it brings uh, IT job for refugees uh, especially in Germany really uh, to the refugees, right? So uh, if you are, as a, as a German, if you have an IT job that you want to get done, many of the folks who come in from uh, Syria are actually designers or programmers, only that they are sitting in these uh, refugee homes and can't really do anything. Uh, so there's a way of trying to make a connection for them. Uh, so, and then also I had mentioned that there was something like an Amazon and eBay that is cooperatively run. So this is uh, fermondo.de coming out of Germany. Uh, uh, founded in 2012, so already operating for quite some time, and there is uh, a sister site now uh, in the UK as well. And the idea is basically to offer mostly fair trade products uh, and uh, operate the whole site transparently. <laughs> uh, so, and uh, they have uh, basically their whole budget is uh, on the website, so you can so that all the 2,000 people who initially invested in it, uh, so with up to 20,000 uh, euros, so that nobody could have controlling influence. Uh, basically, all the users of the site basically invested in it. So this is an example of the zebra economy that I had talked about before, because basically here there is no venture capitalist funding, and it is all invested investments from users, right? So 2,000 users very quickly invested a uh, fairly large amount of money to start this site. And uh, so, of course, I would, uh, couldn't really talk about this without acknowledging that there are also challenges, right? So, and uh, beyond uh, the biggest one, it should probably be sort of take up, you know, the whole screen, which would read something like funding, right? Um, this is, of course, a huge uh, hurdle, but it's also, Marketing, I think, is one of the major issues, right? So you can, for example, in New York, uh, I met a 60-year-old uh, man from Venezuela and uh, Jesus, right? And Jesus is uh, really like a little Cesar Chavez, so he's like very sick. Like, and his mom, and my mom told me, you know, over oh, my dad body will I give into these corporations? And so like a real fighter. And he uh, drove for Uber for many years, and he arrived at JFK one day and looked at his meter and said like, you know, this can't be, this is total exploitation. So he walked out of his cab and started organizing the other drivers. And he got 1,200 drivers to drop out of Uber. And they started their own app, Better Rides. Uh, and of course, nobody in New York has ever heard about them, right? So marketing is a huge issue. Uh, uh, and the network effect, right? So network effect means basically that, you know, it's uh, uh, like something like a fax machine mm -hmm. is worth, uh, Nothing as a technology if only two users have it, but if you have two million people use it, using fax machine, it's an incredibly important technology. So the same happening with Uber and Facebook and Google, right? So the network effect is really in their favor, so it's very hard to push into that. Then, of course, the value proposition needs to be right. They actually need to know something about, uh, you know, co-op history, history of mutuals. Uh, they need to be leadership skills. Uh, we can talk about scale, that's a long discussion, membership involvement, and then of course legislation that needs to be somehow 
also support this model. Uh, so, and then lastly, this really also calls for new institutions, right? A new economy. So we started, like I mentioned, uh, this site, where, which is like a hub where basically people can join this uh, movement. There is now a sister organization to uh, our consortium that I will talk about in a second uh, in Berlin. And uh, I will skip ahead. So this is where the consortium is headed. This is where I work. And uh, so this is the consortium which basically brings together uh, some uh, 40 institutions to support people in that ecosystem, right? With legal advice and uh, with software. And so we are, we are basically, since last November, working on raising money to, to be able to do this kind of work. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, the uh, Business Council here in uh, Australia uh, of cooperatives and mutuals uh, is starting a working group uh, and you should uh, all join it, right? <laughs> uh, so, okay, and so I think these, these institutions are incredibly important. Uh, should you want to make, uh, uh, overcome the tyranny of distance and join us in New York, uh, <laughs> then uh, November 10 to 11, uh, we have the next uh, conference on this top topic, uh, the People's Disruption Platform Co-ops for Global Challenges, and that is it. Right. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Joe Wolf. We have around about a half an hour now to uh, to ask some questions of Trev Wolf. Um, I will be your microphone assistant. Uh, we will record everybody so that we can have everybody on uh, on the recording. Uh, I'd like to be uh, open for questions. Is there someone who's uh, straight out of the straight out of the, the gate? Uh, Nick Westwood, uh, Councillor of Marion, City of Marion. Um, uh, thanks for that, that was very interesting. Uh, I'm all for cooperatives, uh, great idea. Uh, I've been waiting for it for years and uh, uh, actually participating years ago in, uh, participated in creating the co-op, co -op, which eventually failed unfortunately, but that's the way things go. But uh, I'd just like to make a statement and uh, see if you support it, and that is that um, without a doubt in my mind, uh, the future doesn't hold much for most workers if we don't have cooperatives, because there just will not be enough labour to mm. create uh, uh, incomes for people uh, sufficient to survive. So our whole economies will collapse, I believe, unless we do have work participation in cooperatives. Uh, would you agree with that? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think that uh well, I don't know. I mean, it's a bit, I hesitate a moment because I think uh, answer is yes and then but. Uh, and the but maybe uh, just I think that it's uh, the same challenges, of course, that uh, other companies are facing, are also facing cooperatives, right? So the challenge of uh, uh, technological unemployment, right? Uh, and uh, also the, uh, yeah, I mean, automation basically uh, uh, is a big issue. Uh, and so the question is, I think this is just like an open question for me. It's like, I think it's one of the central questions is really how can uh, co-ops insert themselves in this discussion around uh, artificial intelligence and automation? And uh, I have n not met anyone who had an answer to this, but I, th I know it's an important question. So I think it's, that's maybe, uh, maybe I, I give you Talmudic answer, uh, answer mm -hmm. with the question. Philip Papiatis from Enervice. Hey. <clears throat> Just following up on that earlier question, but perhaps looking at it through a different lens. When, um, um, when I see new things being commercialised, I usually see people trying to do what they used to do in a different way. And, um, and the opportunity for creating something totally new is something that most people don't think about. They think about how to become better uh, intermediaries or how to become more efficient or how to become many other things. Mm -hmm. But that's usually a reflection on how they used to be. The examples that you shared um, focused a lot on the skills I have and how I can get a bigger cut and a fairer cut of what I do. 
a return on what I do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> when I look at the future, I think about how pathetic the present is. Why do we, ex why do we tolerate infant mortality in the rates that they are today, mm -hmm. just because they're better than they used to be? Mm -hmm. Why do we live mm -hmm. with the 80-20 rule where mm -hmm. you know, 20 percent of our efforts enough for 80 percent and let's just be lazy and mm -hmm. live with that? So I guess that's the beginning of a question, which mm -hmm. is collaborative models that are more aspirational than just instead of having a job, I'll do my work and I'll get a bigger cut or a fairer cut. Mm -hmm. I understand that's valuable, but we're in a transition, which you flagged there, but or artificial intelligence, automation, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of other things that are going to change the way we contribute productively. Mm -hmm. Many people think that a cabinet maker is going to be a cabinet maker forever, mm -hmm. when many people know that's not the case. Um, so I think there's an opportunity here which goes beyond the example shown. I'm curious as to whether you've done some work or thoughts or developed some thoughts about whatever that forward-looking um, aspiration mm -hmm. might be as opposed to the necessity to drag the mm -hmm. beginning of transition. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. babbling a bit now, so, but I hope you yeah. understand the question. Yeah, you sort of alluded to a question, right? It was really more a comment. Uh, but uh, uh, I think maybe the, com the, the question that you sort of hinted at, I actually, I'm, I'm not sure I completely agree with you there because I think that there is, uh, what they are doing, I think the, the way I visualized it initially was sort of like you grab, uh, the algorithmic heart of Uber and like rip it out and you put in uh, a, a different model. So the idea is basically it, um, uh, it's not just about running the same apps now with cooperative ownership, but it's actually to embed those values that are quite different and that are in a way innovative in that sense uh, in those operations, right? So you saw a little bit about how this plays out differently, let's say, with the design. Uh, in, in the up and go example. So, uh, th so I guess the, the, the message or the, the uh, take that I would uh, uh, offer there would be to say that it's about embracing the technology but embedding those cooperative values. Uh, so it's not just about, uh, it's not just about getting a bit better life for uh, <coughs> the workers but it's of course also about the value proposition. And if you look at Stocksy, for example, you see that this is actually, I mean, I just prefer it as a stock photography site to any other one I know. And it has nothing to do with the cooperative model at all. It's just the value proposition is much better. So I think to say that cooperatives are not able to uh, offer, and this is sort of supine underneath your uh, question, sort of, I see that a little bit, right? To say like that, well, they are not really innovating. Uh, I. It's not that that's not exactly a danger, but I, like, I would not say this is just, I wouldn't say this is a given, right, to that end. Hi, I'm Paul Berkeley. Um, I'm a member of the Greens, and we've just started a, a, a group um, related to how to uh, communicate better with the agricultural sector. We traditionally have a very bad relationship with them, and so we're trying to innovate. One of the things that we're looking at is the cooperative model to help farmers um, develop mm. a better relationship with their industries. Mm -hmm. um, but in the last 20 years, we've seen a, a real collapse. It, the, the agricultural market actually has liberalized mm -hmm. tremendously, and now you have dairy farmers with about you know 200 to 1,000 <coughs> Uh, dairy cattle and are going bankrupt. So I'm asking the question from um, a person with a lot of passion about it but don't have a lot of knowledge in the agricultural sector or in your platform. Mm -hmm. how, would you in, how would you visualize something like that mm -hmm. being applied to um, yeah. not just the farming, yeah. not, not just to the certified uh, organic people who are probably more apt to be into a, a cooperative, but the general farming market. Yeah, well, so this is something uh, we are very aware of because uh, so many uh, cooperatives are in fact agricultural, especially in the global south, right? Uh, so this is something that we try to uh, work on and think through and create a working group around. Uh, it's not something that, but you're absolutely right. I think this is one of the biggest uh, markets, in fact, for that. And uh, there isn't really an answer uh, 
so far. Uh, but it's but we are again like very aware that it's a very important question. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Maybe a woman, yes. Like not just not just a dude. Any woman will do. Any woman um, will do. Yeah. Any any of you here will do. It's fine. You know, <laughs> just like why not you? I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. I'm really convinced by the way these models can enhance economic and social value. Do you have any examples or know of any research that's going on that where these collaborative models are, are better harnessing environmental value, um, having a yeah better environmental difference? Right. Or well, with so right, right, right. So yeah. So the circular economy, right? Just the question. Uh, I mean, what can I say? So it's. I think this is on the. I think this is. The, the 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 will is there, and the if you if you you know I talked to many of the people that you saw of these businesses, and I think they are generally inclined to support that. It's not it's not a perfect world. I can say like yeah, and they are all doing it, and it's perfect perfect solutions <laughs> to everything. So I think it's not right. I mean it's uh, but but I can tell you that Carmondo, for example, and you know with their fair trade uh, example, and very much thinking about these these issues uh, of environmental degradation, uh, very much so. But it's not that they are all, you know, have the perfect solution to that. It's, it's partial, you know. Yeah. I'm going to walk around the back here. It might take me a moment. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to take my own question as we go. Good. Um, yeah. So my, my question is uh, very exciting to, to watch this model and to, to wrap your minds around this model and obviously there's people who have who who are familiar uh, and, and others that have met this. As we see any individual cooperative platform rise, it will obviously reach a critical mass. Mm -hmm. um, now my, my sense is that the monopolists are not going to go quietly. Mm. So I wonder, as I walk around to, to Ken's question at the back, could you make a comment on examples that you've seen where the, a, a cooperative is getting so, so, so much traction uh, that the, the, the traditional model uh, starts to fight back? Uh, no, I, th that's too early. But you know, like if you look at even Fermondo, uh, you know, competing, I mean, and, and explicitly saying that they are competing with Amazon, which, you know, good luck, right? Uh, is is very hard, right? So, but they and it, they are they, none of them has risen to the scale where that would be an issue. No, they are too small. Uh, Stuxy uh, uh, had a, a profits of I think seven point nine million dollars last year, so it's not nothing, but it's not uh, you know it's not a major force in that sense. And I think also in difference to other people, it's, that's why I talk about the diversified digital economy. It's in, in my mind, this is not about destroying the sharing economy, right? So this is not about destroying Uber or Airbnb, but it is, uh, in my mind, I think a much more realistic and, and, and uh, uh, I think very realistic uh, um, projection that uh, there, will, there will be a slice cut out of this economy that will be ethically run by those businesses. And even the people who oppose this model, and there are people who oppose this model, acknowledge that this, that this will has a future. This will happen. This, this, this will grow. This will, the question is only how much will it grow? Will it be a significant part of the economy or a small slice? Right? But that it will grow and that it will um, you know, that its existence will uh, be secured, is, I think, is not much of a question. And you see this. Uh, there are 188 businesses over the last two years that emerged. It's not, uh, you know, it's not taking over the sharing economy, but it's also, you can't ignore it either. So. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it's very uh, enlightening. And uh, it has, uh, <coughs> obviously, a long way to run. Um, over the next few years. We're going through a period of change of generation. Um, in 2023, the baby boomers will almost exit the stage. Mm -hmm. um, but between now and 2023, uh, baby boomers still hold uh, considerable uh, power in uh, management decisions. Mm -hmm. I wonder how we are going to get through the next seven to ten years 
um, in convincing um, mm. in terms of education mm. uh, for the baby boomers because if I look at some of your slides there there are a lot of young faces mm -hmm. and which is inevitable of course but we still have to manage the social uh, issue mm -hmm. over the next 10 years which I think mm. is one of the reasons why we're seeing so much disruption um, mm. there is a resistance um, from the baby boomers uh, to pass over the technology. Yeah, well, I mean, this is, I guess, what I meant with this uh, uh, comment about the baby boomers is that the, the, the task now, exactly as you describe it, is to make a case to them, essentially, right? Make a case to them and make a case to their workers that uh, this idea of worker ownership uh, has value and, uh, you know, there is much research on that, right? I'm working with the... Uh, Labor, Cent uh, Labor and Management Center at uh, Rutgers University, which is focused on uh, worker ownership issues and recommended Hillary Clinton on it, and you know, there's many publications on that. So they, you can actually show like, the economic value of that model quite easily. There's plenty of research to show that, uh, that it has clear advantage uh, to have worker ownership. Uh, and uh, so this just has to be propagated, right? And uh, for for me, like as a you know, also as a professor at a university, it also means to uh, uh, question my students about what I would call their commanded individualism, right? This idea that is sort of implanted in their head uh, from the day they go to school, I guess, uh, that it's all about an individual career, that it is about individual living, and it's about individual work, it's about individual success, right? And to actually think uh, also in uh, cooperative uh, communal solutions, right, to their problems. Right? They're all, they all freaking out about their future, they're all freaking out about their work, right? It's probably the same here. Uh, but they don't see that it might actually be really much easier for them if they would work together if they would think of, of their future as a future that, that they face as a group and not so much as an individual. So more Kropotkin and less Ian Rand, right? Do these references ring a bell? Okay. The fountainhead and all that. Yeah. <laughs> you read it, Ian Rand. I know. Okay. <laughs> So my question is about whether um, you have any, sorry, I'm here, yeah. um, examples of um, education which is delivered using a, um, this kind of model, you know, whether it's at uh, child development level or through to tertiary. Um, well, that's a good, so, uh, well, I, I proposed a cooperative college to my university in 2012, uh, but then I missed the opportunity. It's a, slid away. Uh, no, I, don't, I can't think of uh, examples of that right now, but uh, we are uh, building something to that extent. So we are right now uh, wrote a very large grant and uh, uh, have several foundations, so we are very close to getting fairly major funding to build uh, an online learning platform. So uh, I hesitate calling it a MOOC because it's, uh, people would cringe immediately, or some people at least. Um, and so like a critically reflective MOOC maybe, um, and where you basically talk, you know, into walk people through the history of cooperatives and mutuals and unions, uh, and uh, then introduce this idea of uh, platform co-ops, a bit of digital labor studies, and uh, then actually give them the tools, like we are actually building the tools, so we're building an uh, open source uh, labor platform that cooperatives can use uh, to, uh, to run something like that. Uh, and uh, we're building a governance tool and also a social networking tool and a mapping tool so that uh, you can bring all these people in that ecosystem together. Because like I tried to allude uh, before, the chance is really for a data commons, but also for other um, mutual aid in that ecosystem, which is really a completely different situation than that you would have with, ex with the extractive economy, right? Extractive sharing economy, which would obviously never do that. Right? Airbnb would never cooperate with the competitors. And so, but here you have the, you know, how could a food cooperative help a housing cooperative, help a platform co-op, right? So there is this an amazing potential for mutual aid uh, 
and uh, which has really not been realized very much. So we try through working with particular co-ops, so it's not just sort of like you know helicoptering some technology into uh, needy communities and then magically see them all you know lift themselves out of poverty because of the technology, but it's rather to really work with the workers from day one and build something with them together and uh, 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 and work with the co-ops together all over the world. I mean, in several countries uh, to to make that happen. And Trevor, how do we keep in touch with your progress on that? Uh, well, the platform.coop is a, a good uh, uh, site, and um, platform platform coop, the, the Twitter handle, and uh, you can email me. There's things like email. Yes. Um, the the, uh, the question I'd like to ask. Thank you very much for, for the presentation, Trevor. Um, actually extends on from this question about education. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, there are great examples, mm -hmm. lots of examples of cooperative education and the cooperative college has mm -hmm. got great e-learning resources. For example, the Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutual has got a website dedicated to cooperative education. No, sure. But we're missing, by and large, and this is why the Australian Senate made it a recommendation of the inquiry, mm -hmm. education and awareness, we're largely missing cooperation and cooperative economic theory from, from mainstream curriculum, whether it's commerce, that's business, right, that's legal right. studies. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in what's happening around design thinking. Mm -hmm. um, if, I, if I think of something like Eleanor Ostrom's work mm -hmm. on the commons mm -hmm. and you know her incredible um, deep analysis of the power of cooperation as opposed yeah. to competition to drive innovation yeah. and productivity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering whether we're <coughs> seeing, so looking at the gatekeepers around design thinking and mm -hmm. and a lot of the, um, the paradigms driving innovation, do, do we have some work here to, to look at different frameworks for how we encourage even, you know, at that level of design thinking, a, mm -hmm. a different mindset? In Australia, a couple of examples, uh, in social enterprise development, there's been a very monotheistic model driven, which is largely based on entrepreneurialism, mm -hmm. this, the single entrepreneur, evangelical entrepreneur wanting to do something good, mm -hmm. not cooperative entrepreneurialism. And also with social impact investing now, this idea that investment is going to come from outside and mm -hmm. match innovation is missing this whole piece around impact investing coming from the community. It can also come from the community in a cooperative mm -hmm. model. So what, what, what's happening in design thinking and is there a block there, do you think? I think it was, a, I couldn't have put it more nicely as a comment, I was uh, great. So like the question, I, I agree with you. I think in terms of the educational examples, uh, what you describe are resources, that's not a platform co-op per se. So but uh, no, I agree with you, of course, completely. Um, well, design thinking, it's, uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna speak at UTS uh, tomorrow with uh, Cameron Tonkinweis, who's probably the, one of the leading, I mean, I don't know, at least last time I checked in the United States, he was one of the leading designers. Um, and uh, so he used to teach at the New School, then went to Carnegie Mellon, and then very quickly exited to Australia, just in time when the Trump administration started. <laughs> very clever. Um, and uh, so I think he, uh, you know, like we, when, when he spoke in 2015 at uh, the Platform Co-op Conference at the New School, he was, uh, we were starting to think about design solutions. And actually, this, you saw this a little bit with uh, the uh, Up and Go, uh, where actually a different, uh, like a cooperative thinking really leads to a different design, right? Uh, like you saw that they were not submitting to the individual worker, which has also something to do with some of them being undocumented, right? So how do you protect undocumented low-income workers? Uh, this was design solution that they found here is one. Another one is that they also found a way of paying people in cash, which is uh, also unheard of for a startup, right? So people are not paid in cash. Uh, so, but if you have undocumented workers, you have to pay them in cash. Uh, so. Uh, issues like that are addressed or, you know, I remember Cameron talking about um, maybe somehow visualizing the social status of a worker by saying, you know, this person has four children 
and uh, so that may be leading to higher tips. But then, of course, immediately the the dark cloud of privacy started arising. So it's all these uh, uh, questions. But it's a huge, and yet another sort of working group that needs to be formed and uh, and pushed forward. Yeah. There's uh, room for some organising here in, in Australia. We've got yeah. time for two more. Um, Melissa and then Susan, I'll come back to you. Thank you. And thank you for your presentation. Um, my questions are probably more so around matched energy. And I think, you know, the concept of a co-op is something that most people think, you know, that could be of a significant benefit to a number of industries. Mm -hmm. But in terms of actually then getting that off the ground, finding the match en energy and then matching the workload within the profit and, and how that then works, what strategies have you used in the past to implement that? Uh, so that needs to be a bit more elaborated on, um, like what exactly are you talking about? Um, well, obviously, you know, particularly within the dairy industry, for instance, yeah. there's a number of people that are, are very supportive of that movement. But, you know, one person or two farmers don't necessarily make a co-op. You would need that larger collective. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Works so right how do you actually start them? And the motivation yeah. from a larger collective of people. Well, this is in a way like something that we try to do with this. MOOC uh, that we are sort of instigating, which is partially its function is also social, right? So with Up and Go, for example, when I talked to the developers, they were saying, well, designing this platform was the smallest part of the process, <coughs> right? But getting all these co-ops to sign on to this, right? In span, like, you know, convincing them in Spanish, right? Because they have to, everything has to be translated. Uh, convincing all these different groups to actually join this project was a way bigger challenge than designing the app, right? Uh, so I think these social processes have to be like really emphasized, right? So uh, yeah, so I mean, I don't have the magic answer to that either. I had, uh, but I do get these, I see the need. So I get these emails like, you know, almost every day where like the other week I got one from a dog sitter in Los Angeles who said, uh, you know, can you connect me to other dog sitters in Los Angeles because I want to go on vacation and for that I need to start a cooperative. Uh, and uh, and so uh, and I said like well you know good luck with that so it's like I mean I don't you know so like so and this is and then and then but out of these questions or you get you know I got approached like from Argentina from like these women who wanted to start a, a babysitting co cooperative or from these uh, six men in India who are programmers and want to join this movement you know so that all this this is just like way above my head and so that's really where you need an institution. So this is why we started this consortium and, and seek funding and really need to staff, right, and need to sort of build this out as an institution because, I mean, I'm just overworked. Yeah. I mean, we're all out, but this is, it's not, it's beyond what one person can do. Yeah. Okay, Susan, we'll see if, if yours is quick, we might have time for yours as well, but we, I do, we do need to put uh, Trevor in a non-Uber, I think. <laughs> more not a question but a, um, um, possibly an idea but it seems to me that this whole idea of cooperatism it could is like a mindset that people mm -hmm. want to do want mm -hmm. to work like that want to work together mm -hmm. and uh, I think there's an, a really a good opportunity to drive this into at the schools because young mm -hmm. people in schools the mm -hmm. kids are really interested in this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, they're interested in working together, mm -hmm. and the, the way to, to do that, of course, is all in the learning design, mm -hmm. is, is how d the design, uh, right. as the, as the mm -hmm. students, you know, working together and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, having the, the challenges and being able to be given challenges and, and work. So at the new school, we work uh, with Mondragon, uh, which is about the largest uh, Catalan Spanish uh, cooperative. And uh, so we created a living lab, it's called. And the idea is to create uh, little uh, segments of curriculum and then find uh, uh, courses all around the university that have some connection with co-ops, just uh, anything, right? Anything that vaguely relates to that model. And then plug in uh, these segments into their course so that basically somebody comes into their class and delivers the co-op section uh, to that class. And this is uh, in the making. Yeah, well, it's it's a as a collaboration. You know, I mean, that, that's a very lockstep way of understanding what the kids can actually do if they're given questions and challenges mm -hmm. uh, as a basis of their curriculum. And there's a school just over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to push back. No, it's great. Yeah, yeah I agree and with you. And, and it, is a, it is a way that 
young people are really in, can get engaged in this sort of thing. Yeah, I'm um, all of it. Yeah. And particularly coming up with their own challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm like and next. And what they are noticing yeah. and what they could do. Yeah, I mean, I teach a class on uh, inequality and technology, right? Relationship between in a, uh, inequality and technology. And as, as practice component next year, we will uh, design a student governed platform uh, that, you know, they can use. And I, I promise them that I will not have any responsibility in it, and it will be entirely run by them. Yeah. And I will do nothing in relation to it, except inspire them to do it. Yeah. And take the credit for it. <laughs> and, and then. The Business Council would support a pilot in education. The Business Council of Co-op, if you've got one. Well, you know, the Australian Science and Mathematics Board's just over there. But mm -hmm. there are a lot of other high schools that have so just just want to go there. Great, so the last question. Can I make a quick yeah. comment? Um, yeah. But I, I was interested in the, the um, dog sitting club example, because it seems to me people have these great ideas for getting together, but then they don't actually know the legal form. And, and you have, yeah. you've said governance is a big issue. I, yeah. My background is law, so I'm yeah. very interested in governance and how yeah. and the potential for abuse of mm -hmm. a cooperative, and which is manif um, it's, it's manifest now because of the quickness of everything on the internet, if you mm -hmm. like, and the ease with which data mm -hmm. can be stolen. So I think there's a whole lot of issues around governance. But I'm just wondering if, if, if behind that we get the more traditional legal structures like mm -hmm. companies, but then right. the new um, innovation, like in Britain, where they have community interest companies, mm -hmm. that fits very nicely with these, mm -hmm. this kind of platform. Um, so like to solve, I mean, so the, the first step is uh, people sometimes asking, you know, uh, where are the others, like this dog sitter? Uh, and then the second question is, what are the legal conditions? And so there we are working uh, with uh, the, at, at Harvard University with the Berkman Center. Uh, and there's actually already in the making uh, to create uh, click-through templates uh, for contracts for, to create uh, platform co-op uh, contracts. And then do the same for bylaws. Right. So there are bylaws, uh, this example, Logonomics, they worked for two years with, uh, uh, with the Sustainable Law Center in California uh, to create uh, bylaws that make a pivot impossible. Right? So because that's uh, the, the, the pivot in the startup scene, right? it's like an exit, right? so you, you, you cash out to Google, uh, they buy you out. Uh, which is, of course, how many startups are built. That's just their whole goal in life, right? Their whole uh, objective. Uh, with the co-op, it's, of course, different. And so they basically make sure in the bylaws that it is absolutely impossible. So that if somebody comes with a billion dollars and says, like, hey, founders, want to have a billion dollars? And basically, they can't take it. Yeah. They can't, you can't, uh, can't destroy the co-op. Mm -hmm. So and and so that so you can give these examples and make that very easy for people to replicate that, right? So um, and and there are so there are a lot of lawyers involved. Uh, so I mean, one of the major proponents is Jokai Benkler, who is a, a professor for entrepreneurial law at uh, at the Harvard Law School. So it sounds like there's a there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of organizing to be done. Um, there's a lot of resources being developed at the moment, and I think, uh, Trevor, your, your site's going to be one to follow. Uh, a fabulous... Well, uh, Melina's site, really, uh, so that... Uh, Melina's site as well. You have... <coughs> We've got a, a landing page that will link... A landing page <coughs> on the postcard that will link to everything that's happening globally with Trevor. Wonderful. Wonderful. And, of course, a, a conference in, in New York in yes. November. November uh, 10 to 11 should you wish. Yeah. Uh, Hop over, come for We do need to let Trevor go to his next appointment. There is still tea and coffee and biscuits, so if you'd like to take a few moments and organise a co-op uh, in the room here today, then please do stick around with us. Um, in the meantime, I'll ask my lovely assistant to, uh, to come across. We couldn't let uh, anybody come to Australia, and certainly not South Australia, without leaving with a bottle of wine. So, Catch, yeah. if you would like to, uh, yeah. to hand uh, Trevor a little gift on behalf of us. Thank Enjoy. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>